Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's a wonderful, nice day inside. I wouldn't want to be outside today. The wind will blow the head off you, but it's beautiful in here. And it's good to see your smiles as we come together to uh, worship the Lord. I'd like to welcome everybody who is here um, sitting in the pews, uh, those listening on Lighthouse FM, and those watching the live stream. Welcome to the uh, worship service of the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in St. John's on 30 Aldershot Street. And now for those of us here, and even if you're at home, you can do this as well. Let's take a minute now to greet those around us, to give a smile, a wave, a handshake, whatever you want. Just say hello to those around you and welcome them into the fellowship of the Lord. It's amazing the change that that makes. You look like a good group, but everybody's smiling now. Praise the Lord. I'd like to uh, introduce those on the platform who will be helping out in, in the service today. Um, Second Advent is gonna be having our praise time and special music. Quado will be having our scripture reading. Teofile will be taking care of our offering. Um, he's not on the platform, but Charles will be helping us out by providing the children's feature this morning. And we have a special guest with us this morning uh, providing the sermon and the pastoral prayer, and that's Pastor Paul Llewellyn, who is the president of the SDA Church in Canada. When I was talking with Paul in the, uh, uh, the pastor study there before we came out, I asked him if this was his first time to Newfoundland, because sometimes, you know, people from away, they have to have a first time. But it's not his first time in Newfoundland, and as a matter of fact, his grandmother is from Newfoundland, so he's very welcome here. Kissed the cod too. Oh, and he has kissed the cod, so there you go. He's uh, he's he's allowed to be here. We'll say that, and we we, uh, we thank him for uh, providing us with God's word this morning, and um, we'd also like to thank Brian and Chris and those up in the uh, uh, the sound booth there helping all this happen. Without Brian, you wouldn't hear me, and people at home wouldn't see me. So not that seeing me is a blessing, but anyway, we still want to thank Brian for that. Um, our call to worship this morning. Um, I'm going to look at the book of Psalms, and it's Psalm 98, and I'm going to read verses 4 to 9. And I'll be reading it from the message. It says, Shout your praises to God, everybody. Let loose and sing. Strike up the band. Round up an orchestra to play for God. Add on a hundred voice choir. Feature trumpets and big trombones. Fill the air with praises to King God. Let the sea and its fish give a round of applause with everything living on earth joining in. Let ocean breakers call out encore and mountains harmonize the finale. A tribute to God when he comes, when he comes to set the earth right. He'll straighten out the whole world. He'll put the world right and everyone in it. And let's, uh, let's bow our heads for a moment now and we'll have a, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day. We thank you that we can be gathered here to sing your praises, to hear your words, to be with you and to be with others who love you. We want to pray that your spirit would fall upon us now, that we would feel your presence, that you would draw us close to you and lift us up, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now I'd like to ask the rest of Second Advent to join me as we uh, lead out in song.
Happy Sabbath. We don't sound too happy. It's supposed to be a happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. All right. God is good. And all the time. Yeah, we thank God so much for his protection and guidance throughout this week. Yeah. Our first song will open the eyes of my heart. Our first song.
one more time. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I song for today is number 163, At the Cross. We're going to pick up the tempo a little bit. At the Cross. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Amen. Amen. Even though some offerings may leave a positive impression on human beings, they may not necessarily impress God. But there was an offering that so greatly impressed Jesus that he called his disciples to watch it. Strangely, he told them that the small amount that the poor widow gave was more than the much that the rich put in that day. Was Jesus promoting small offerings as an ideal, or did he have something else in mind? One thing is sure, God is not impressed by the quantity or large amounts that may be donated. Otherwise, Jesus would have commended those big temple donors. 
but he was not impressed by their large offerings. Ellen G. White indicates God's criteria for offerings by saying that the value of the gift is estimated not by the amount, but by the proportion that is given and the motive that actuates the giver. Did you notice the word proportion? In Deuteronomy 16, 17, we also read, each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. That poor widow was commended because proportion is one of God's important criteria by which he estimates an offering, and she gave the highest proportion, 100%. As George Miller said, God judges what we give by what we keep, and she did not retain anything but decided to live by faith, trusting that God would provide for her in his goodness and power. Now, how do we decide how much we give as offering? While the tithe proportion cannot be altered, we may ask the Spirit to lead us in determining the percentage of our income that we will return to God as offerings. That percentage may be increased and will reveal how big our affection, trust, and gratitude are toward Him. Jesus is still not impressed by amounts of money, little or much, but He still values the spirit of sacrifice, which may be expressed by the poor and rich alike, according to the proportion given. As we bring our tithes and offerings, may we put our desires last and God first. Good morning, church. As our deacon are coming, are preparing to receive our offerings, Today's offerings are for our new founder and mission. Let us pray. Dear God, you are the giver of all good gifts, and your word make clear that every good and perfect gift came from you. We ask you that you accept this gift from the hand of your children today, and we, you use for your glory of your kingdom. Kindly, Accept our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
It's that special time now in our service uh, for the children. I'd like to ask all the children to come up and sit here in the, uh, the front pew. And Charles has a special feature for you. Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. How are you doing? Okay. Today I'm going to share a story about two wonderful friends who were in the same school. Once you are in school, I hope that this lesson will help you for you to live well in school. Abigail and Mercy were very good friends. One day, Mercy showed signs of depression. And Abigail went close to her and then inquired why she was depressed. Unfortunately, Mercy's father has lost his job. And the financial situation of the family had become very bad. And so they were struggling to make ends meet. When Abigail got home, she shared the information with her family. And then they extended an invitation to Mercy's family to join them to dine one of the days that they were having a special occasion. So when their family came, the father of Abigail engaged in an um, informal conversation with the father of Mercy. And through that, he was able to identify some skills that they needed in their workplace. Abigail's father was the hiring manager of a company. So when he identified that skill, he sent Mercy's father a message when they got home to send his resume and then booked an appointment for an interview the next day. When Mercy's father went for the interview, he passed the interview when he was given a job. And from there, Mercy's father's family and their financial situation changed and they became happy. That is the end of the story. There are some lessons from the story that I want to share with you. As children of God, we are supposed to make children, make friends with children of God. Why do I say that? If you are a friend with a child of God, he always seeks for your welfare and also make sure that you are always okay and in good health when you are in school. So as you go to school all the time, make friends of people who love God. Two, also remember to seek for the welfare of your friends. When you see somebody down, it's good for you to inquire why he or she is down. And if you have any help to give, you can do that. Three, and let's go to our parents. We should always ask for updates of our children's day-to-day -day activity. If you have been asking for an opportunity to lend a helping hand to somebody, the information from our children can be an avenue for us to help people. So we should remember that. And if the Lord gives you an avenue to help somebody, I want us to remember this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, verse 24, who is reading for us? I read Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 to 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive reward of inheritance, for you served the Lord Christ. Amen. And so if the Lord gives us an avenue for us to help people, we should have it in mind that we are doing to please God, but not for man. The last thing that I would add is that 
we should also show examples that we are trained as children of God in school so that people would also come to us to share our prob their problems with us. May the Lord be with us and help us for us to be good children in school. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us this avenue for us to share this story. We ask that you help us and give us the strength for us to be good examples wherever we find ourselves. Please be with us and lead us throughout our activity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can go and have your seats. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. And as we uh, prepare our hearts now for the morning prayer, um, we will sing the first verse of Whisper a Prayer. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, in a world that seems upside down, everything is going upside down, Lord. The earth seems like it is groaning more and more than it ever has. People are restless, people are looking for peace, Lord, and not finding it. Today, Lord, we come into this church, Lord, to worship you to enjoy the peace that you give. But not just peace, Lord, rest. We get to rest in you for all that you have done, are doing, and will do for us throughout eternity. So today, Lord, let us enjoy that peace and that rest. But Lord, let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's go out there and tell other people. Today, Lord, we come with burdens, we come with joy, we come with uh, different emotions to you today. And Lord, I know that you hear everything. You hear our deepest thoughts, our deepest angst, our, our pain, our hurt, our happiness, our joy. Lord, you hear that all. And before we have even uttered help, Lord, from our lips, you are giving it. We may not understand the way you work, Lord, on this earth, but there is going to be a time when we will understand that fully. And Lord, I don't think any of us will regret the way that you have led. So today, Lord, we worship you. We thank you for bringing us here. We invite your Holy Spirit, Lord, that it may all be about you and that you will be glorified. That we will come to know you more, Lord, and that, again, we won't keep it to ourselves. We will want to share it with somebody else. Sometimes, Lord, we don't need to use words to share the everlasting gospel. We can do it through our acts of kindness, of service to other people. Thank you, Jesus, for leaving your throne, coming here, taking off your outer robe, Lord, washing the feet of the disciples, and, Lord, going to the cross on our behalf. Thank you for all that you have done and are doing in the most holy place for us. And now, Lord, we want to know you at a deeper and deeper level than we have ever known before. So be with us today, Lord. Let us leave this place, Lord, rejoicing because we have a God in heaven who loves us so much. We are his dear children, and Lord, you cannot wait to come back. So we look forward to your soon return. In your name I pray, amen.
As Pastor Llewellyn was saying, this world is, seems to be crumbling around us, but this is not our final home. In my father's house, The beginning of the word says, all the windows are broken and the lights have gone dim, but in my father's house. All the windows are broken. All the lights have gone dim All the doors they hang open Letting time move in Built on a poor foundation And time has not been too kind devastation that's why I'm here to remind that the, the Lord, Lord has gone before us to prepare a place forever if it weren't so he'd have told us but he told us what we'll find in my father's house. In my father's house, there are many mansions in my father's house. what we'll find in, in my father's house in my father's house there are many mansions in my father's house in my father's house 
Good morning, everyone. Great Big C has nothing on our second Advent group. Yeah. For all those that are fans of Great Big C. Thank you so much for the music. Thank you so much for everything. It is so good to be in God's house today. Even though every time I come to this church, the wind is always blowing. I haven't seen chandeliers swing uh, too much, but uh, it's, it's good to be in uh, with you all here today as we worship the Lord. Thank you, Elder Murley, for giving me this spot because I know that you were supposed to be preaching today, I think. And thank you, Pastor, for the uh, pulpit. I uh, do appreciate uh, the spot. And Elder Murley, are you responsible for those chairs? You are. Yeah, because... Um, and the board, and the board. They're very comfortable. Uh, when I was taking psychology at Andrews University, I had a teacher named Dr. Fadley, and Dr. Fadley taught in a lazy boy chair. He had uh, mistakenly during World War II or during the Korean War uh, been positioned by a radar that was aimed right at his back, and it, he was, his back was disintegrating, so he taught in a lazy boy. And uh, I said, if I ever get to teach in a lazy boy, that, I've made it. That's good. So thank you for the beautiful chairs. Thank you for the beautiful church uh, this morning. Uh, it is good to see the work go on in Canada across this nation. Uh, something is happening in Canada and the United States and around the world. We, we have not seen this before to such a state, but I'm going to liken it to a thing that we like to uh, call the la latter rain, but I call it the early rain. People are starting to wonder what's going on in this world. And as they wonder, they are seeking out people that have peace in their lives. And as this world gets more crazy, they will look for people that even though everything's falling apart around them, they have peace. And people are coming to people and to places like this church to come out and find about peace. And we have this uh, phenomena happening. I like to go to small churches. Uh, it's easy to go to the large churches, but it's, I like to go to the small churches. And as I go to some of our very small churches throughout Canada, I remember I was just at one in Ontario, and as I was there, it was a snowstorm day. Um, I traveled an hour to get there, but... In Ontario, there's a certain line. If you live north of that line, there's snow, and if you live south of that line, it, there's no snow. And so uh, where I was traveling along the 401, there was not any snow, but if you lived north of the 401, you had about two feet of snow. So when I got to the church, there was, it, it, was, it was felt well attended. But uh, one of my friends came up, that lady that I'd worked with for many years, and she said, Paul, we're usually very crowded, but a lot of our church members can't uh, come because of the snow and I said, oh, I understand that. I said, usually we have an overflow room. And I said, pardon me? She said, we have a room downstairs uh, for 20 people, and we're even outgrowing the overflow room. And I'm looking around. I said, this is a small community church. What's going on? They said, we don't know. People are coming. The day I spoke, uh, two people walked in off the street and wanted to hear about God's word. So people be praying. Something is happening out there. And if God's people are praying, God will use us to do his work. This morning I want to talk to you about some of the instances that Jesus had in that he encountered. And it's going to be leading to a point. But before I begin, let's just bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that this is not about me, that this is about you that the three instances that we're going to study in the Bible, Lord, will help us understand more who you are. So, Lord, help us to uh, see you clearly today. In your name I pray. Amen. There's a story in the Bible where um, there was a lady, well, there was probably also a man involved, where she was caught in adultery. And the Pharisees, doing what they did best, dragged her, but not him, to the foot of Jesus, because they were going to get Jesus. Uh, there, there's a phenomenon that I know. There's, there's people that love to get people, and they like to just, oh, let me ask this question, because this is going to stump them. And so the Pharisees came with this attitude to Jesus, the Messiah, the Creator, and they were going to get him on something. They, they knew that this was not a sincere person, and they knew that they were going to find something that they could get him. So they brought this lady caught in adultery, 
to Jesus. And they said, Jesus, what are we going to do with her? We caught her in adultery. And Jesus did something amazing there. And, and I love to read the small things that the Word of God has. Don't pass over some of the small things um, in the Bible where usually we just read it and, and all that. Notice the small details in it. Jesus was standing up when she was brought. But at the end of the story, he's not standing up. He's bending over. You see, when she was brought in all the pain, and, yeah, and she knew that she was going to be stoned to death, Jesus was shaking up the social order of the day. He was taking the, the, um, the traditions, the things that the Pharisees, the, 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 the uh, Israelites of the day were, were doing, and he was shaking it up. He wasn't going by their standards he was going by his father's standards. And as they brought her there, Jesus does something different. He bends down. And it says he probably wrote in the sand or something like that. But the act of bending down, you see, when you were stoned, you usually weren't standing up. And in fact, they still do stonings today in the Middle East, where they bury you up to your waist or, your, or, or up to here, and then they stone you're always in a lower position. What Jesus did that day, which, which just is incredible, is that Jesus took the position to be stoned, thus trading places with the lady that was brought to him. Jesus always shakes up the standards of the day to really give the heart of who God is. We, we go on in the story, and if you go to Matthew chapter 15, verse 3, there's a story there about the Pharisees again coming to Jesus to, to find something that they could just stump him with, that they could get him, that they could point a finger, that maybe they could take him and stone him too. And the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we notice something. Your disciples don't wash their hands like they should before eating. And Jesus says to them, uh, and basically the, the, uh, what they say is, why do your disciples disobey our traditions of the elders? For they ignore our traditions of ceremonial hand washing before they eat. And then Jesus turns it around and he says, why do you by your traditions violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, you say, on your father and the mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of your father or mother must be put to death. See, they were looking for other things. Their traditions had put so much um, emphasis on other areas that were, that were clouding the image of God to the people that day. And they were saying, you know, Jesus, you know, we have the ceremony hand washing. Why do your disciples not do that? And instead of Jesus coming out saying it's not important, he said, Guys, you're coming with these traditions, and yet the commandments of God, you, you will totally disrespect and disobey. So Jesus was turning everything upside down as the people were bringing these questions to get at him. So when we read the Bible, we realize that Jesus at that time was shaking up the social order. He was just messing it up, and they didn't like that. The way that they had been comfortable in their traditional worship, Jesus came and was upsetting the, the, the cart. And they did not like that. Now, if we go to um, John chapter 4, verse 15. We're going to read a story. Oh, sorry, John chapter 4, uh, verse 1. John chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to read a story about Jesus again, shaking up the social order. And if you have your Bibles, it says, Jesus knew the Pharisees um, had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, although Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Now, if you were a good um, law-abiding Jew you would avoid a certain area going from Jerusalem all the way to Galilee. You would avoid Samaria because those were the Samaritans. 
the tribes that had left the, the, the southern tribes, these were part of the northern tribes. They had their own system of worship. We, we, we know about it that after Solomon, when they uh, were going there, they didn't want to worship in Jerusalem anymore, so they had their own system of worship, and they built a calf, golden calf again, to worship. And of course, we often wonder what that golden calf symbolizes, is the Egyptians had a go-between to God and between man. And when Moses went up on the mountain, the go-between between between God and man, Moses had disappeared. And so they said, well, in Egypt, the go-between was this cow. And so they had manufactured a cow, the go-between between between God and man. And so when they had left the worship in Jerusalem and they were making their own, they thus built a calf, the go-between between God and man. And so they had had their own system of worship. They had had their own traditions and things like that. But Jesus did something very, very incredible. He said he had to go through Samaria on the way. It didn't say he chose, you know, he he just wandered through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. See, Jesus knew he had a meeting. He had an appointment with a person who had no idea that the, the Messiah was going to come and meet her to that day. See, Jesus likes to fly under the radar. Jesus likes to fly under the radar. He says, when there's so much going on here, I like to go incognito and go somewhere else. Jesus was flying under the radar at that time, and he had to go through Samaria because there was a woman that was lonely, that had been mocked at, and that had been ashamed. And Jesus wanted to go where people needed him the most. So he goes to this area He goes to the area of Sikar to meet one person. Instead of staying in his nice, comfortable place where he could have stayed, instead of staying on the safe journey, he said, no, I'm going to go through Samaria because I need to meet with somebody. So Jesus went there. Jesus went to where it was uncomfortable, where, where their people might not mix with you very well. Jesus went there. How often do we leave our places of comfort, our living rooms, our our places of work, our, our church, to go meet with people who need to see what it is like to have peace and rest in your heart? So often we cling to ourselves. We love to hang out with ourselves, but not often enough do we go out to meet where the people are. How many of us go to Tim Hortons daily to meet with the people? How many of us go to places where other people are where they would probably never ever see the light and day of a Christian? We like to cling to ourselves. We like to hang out with ourselves. But Jesus loved to go to hang out with what the Pharisees said where the sinners were. Jesus loved to do that. He loved to interact with people that needed him. See, the the Pharisees didn't need him. They had no need for him whatsoever. So Jesus went to where he was needed. And eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. This past summer we had our educational convention down in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, my wife and I love heat. Uh, In fact, when I was a teacher... Uh, We always vacationed during the summer. And our habit was to go down to Florida in July. And everybody would ask and said, why are you going down to Florida in July? And they said, because it's hot. And we like the heat. And it would always take me about three weeks of laying on the beach after teaching. Sometimes I was, I I remember one year I was um, chaplain at Crawford Divinity Academy, teaching uh, religion there and also pastoring a church. So when it came time to my vacation, I was exhausted. And I remember going down to Clearwater, Florida, and just lying there, and it took me about three weeks before I could feel my brain working again. Just lying on the beach, relaxing, enjoying the sunshine. Sorry, I hope your mouths are not watering over the sunshine as you're enduring the melting of your your huge... I remember Pastor John uh, sent me a picture of the snowbanks in one of the areas around here, 10 feet high. I showed that to everybody I saw when they were complaining about the snow that we had in Toronto. But anyways, when my wife and I went to Phoenix, 
the temperature reached around 49 degrees Celsius. And my wife and I said that was hot. But where this lady was at noontime, it reaches about 50 degrees Celsius. And I call that very hot. In fact, when my wife and I were in Phoenix, we had been there for a few days. I had three sets of meetings, so I was there for, for over a week. Um, by the end of the week, it was going down from 49 to 46 degrees Celsius. And my wife and I actually looked at each other when it was 46 degrees, and I said, it's kind of chilly out, isn't it? We had gotten so used to the 49 that when it went to 46, we noticed the temperature difference. But here Jesus is hanging out at the well when it is extremely hot outside. And we know the story well that this lady came. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Jesus knew what he was doing. He needed to be there alone to meet this lady. And as his lady comes to the well, he starts talking to her. And he says, can I have some water? And the woman was surprised, for the Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. So this lady, a Samaritan, is looking at Jesus and going, why is this guy talking to me? He shouldn't. We're different people. We don't mix together very well. And the Jews would never ever associate with the Samaritans unless it was an emergency. And so she said, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. In other words, there was a class. The Jews thought themselves up here, the Samaritans a little bit lower, but she said, I'm a Samaritan woman. And at the time, the social order said that you were a lot lower. Remember, Jesus was coming to shake up the social order. Where is God calling us to go today? Jesus was going to a Samaritan woman, which if he had an audience at that time, they would probably say, no, no, Jesus, no, 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 no. You can't talk to them, and you especially can't talk to her. But Jesus came to shake that up. Jesus said, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. You're a man, I'm a woman. And Jesus was breaking down that barrier, that barrier that we put up. And I'm wondering today, do we put up the same barriers in our church? Where Jesus comes to get rid of those barriers, we put up those barriers between us. And she goes, why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if, only, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you were speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. You see, people, I like water. I like it a lot. In fact, I came into the hotel room yesterday, and they had put two bottles of Fiji water. And I was like, wow, they're putting the real good water out. And I took a sip, and I said, it's pretty good, but my favorite water is bottled in Quebec. It's called Esca. And I love it. It's very smooth. It's nice. It's a, it from, comes from a very good spring. And I like water. And this lady was coming to the best place you could get water, which was Jacob's well. There was no better place to get water. It was Jacob's well. And here Jesus says, I want to give you living water. Jesus is giving her a free gift. A free gift with no strings attached. Water that you will not thirst. People, we have good news to share. You and I have this living water to share. Do we add conditions to the accepting of the living water? Jesus said, here, I'm giving you living water. He didn't say, I'm giving you living water if you do this. He says, I'm giving you living water. Do you want it? How often as we as Christians in any faith always give conditions to the free gift of everlasting life? Look how simple the instructions were that Jesus was giving. Look how simple. He says, here, here's living water. Do you want it? All she had to do was go, yeah. No conditions. No, I'm going to have you have to do this and this and this and this before you can have that living water. It was, do you want living water? 
I, I look at when the disciples had to have one of their councils, when so many Gentiles were coming into the church that the Jewish people of the day were getting up in arms going, oh, wait, 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 wait. We can't have all these Gentiles coming into the church. Listen, we have all these laws that we obey, and the Gentiles are coming in just, you know, they're going to take over our church soon. And if we don't do something to stop what they have or what they're doing, our church is going to be inundated with Gentiles, and we can't have that. So they came and asked the disciples. They said, you're going to have to give some conditions to these Gentiles. So the disciples got together, who had been with Jesus for a long time, and they gave two simple instructions. Two simple instructions that they asked the Gentiles to follow. Stay away from food that has been sacrificed to idols. And stay away from sexual immorality. Both conditions said basically stay away from the pagan temples. Because that's where you would find the food sacrificed to, to, to idols. And that's where the sexual immorality went on in their worship services. And he said just stay away from that. And I'm looking, I said, wait, wait, hold it, hold it. Aren't you going to put some other conditions to that? And that's all the disciples did, is stay away from those two things. Said, if you do that, it will go well. So if, in other words, if you take your pagan worships that you're used to, and you stay away from that, you'll come to know God fuller when you hung, hang around with all of us who are worshiping God. And they made it very easy. How often do we meet with people, and we just lay it down really hard? I've done that. I remember my wife's pastor, uh, my wife lived in California for a short time, and um, her pastor uh, was one of my favorite speakers, Morris Venden. I love Morris Venden. I love reading his books. You know why? Because I could understand them. They weren't deep theological things that just were very hard to understand. Morris Venden spoke so that even a grade six student could understand. And I don't know if you know why, but his daughter, um, I think, was Down syndrome. And he wanted to make sure she understood his sermons. So I like Morris Vendon. He was on my level. Uh, and uh, he spoke. And, and I remember him telling us at Andrews University once when he came to speak. He said, I was giving Bible studies to about 30 people in one family. And he said, it started out good. First Monday, we, we met together in their house. There was about 30 people. The second time he met together, there were about 35. And they were bringing their friends and family for these Bible studies. And he, he was doing these Bible studies, and as he was doing them, about the third or fourth time, he said, I'm going to lay down some of the good stuff we believe. And he laid down the beast of Revelation. And the people were listening, and they didn't have smiles on their faces. They were just pondering what he was saying. So after the meeting was over, the next Monday, he called them up and said, are we ready for our Bible study? And they said, oh, no, 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 we have, a, we have uh, some illness going throughout our family. It wouldn't be good for you to be here. He said, okay, well, okay, next Monday we'll meet. Next Monday, he called them up, oh, no, no, pastor, we had a fire, and we were all helping uh, somebody recover from that fire, so today wouldn't be a good time to meet. You know, they never ended up meeting again. And I remember Morris Venden telling us, he said, I started to ride the beast before it was time to ride the beast. When we talk about Jesus, people, and as Jesus was encountering this woman from Samaria, he was very gentle on her. He didn't lay it down hard. He didn't, he didn't uh, lay down, you know, if, if you want to really follow God, you must do this, this, and this, this. He was very gentle. He wanted to give her the living water. He wanted to make sure she had living water before greater truths would come in. And so he talked to her more. And in verse 11 it says, But sir, you don't have a rope or bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? She was bewildered. And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? Oh, people, sometimes we ask questions where the answer, if we knew the real answer, we would be ashamed. Here this lady is, talking to the Messiah, the Creator, and she says, listen, Jacob gave us this well. Do you think you're greater than Jacob? How can you offer better water than his sons and the animals enjoyed? You have nothing to draw with. 
So she was saying, I have something to draw this water. This is living water. You have nothing to draw with, so I am in control here. How many times, people, do we come with a superior of politics, the superior of religiosity? I have stuff that you don't have. I have truth that you don't have. And she was coming to Jesus like that. You're not greater than our father Jacob, but Jesus does not answer back in superiority. He goes, I have a different water than the one you're drinking. And if you continue to drink here, you will be thirsty. I want to ask you today, how many of you are thirsty? How many people in the church today, this church, the Christian church today, are still thirsty, drinking water that will not satisfy? How many of us follow rabbit holes going here or going there that confuse us, that are so complicated that it goes nowhere? I have a rule that when somebody finds some new special truth or something, that I give them five years to prove it. And if in five years they are not a happier, more loving, more peaceful person, then I know what they have been chasing after is worthless. Worthless. So people today, if whatever is going on in our life, whatever we're following, whatever rabbit hole we're going down, if it's not causing us to be more at peace, and that's the peace comes from the throne of God, if it doesn't cause more joy in our lives, if it doesn't make us friendlier with other people, then what we're following after might not be the direction we need to be going. So Jesus replied to this lady, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I will give them will never be thirsty. It becomes fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And the lady says, Please, sir. The woman said, give me this water because she had been coming to this well avoiding everybody else for a very long time. Then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. Because when she had to come there and get water, there was no social interaction because she came at a time when there was nobody else around. She was looking for water that she would never thirst again. And so Jesus goes to her, go get your husband. Jesus told her. I, I could imagine Jesus doing that with a smile on her face. And she goes, I don't have a husband, the woman said. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You see, in those days, you were allowed to be divorced um, three times. When you got divorced three times, you were a persona non grata. You were a person that meant nothing. You were the lowest of the low. But she had not just been divorced three times. She had been divorced five times. And the sixth man that she was living with was not her husband. In other words, he was getting a free ride. He was getting all the perks. But he was treating her like she was nothing. If she was worth anything, he would have married her. But he treated her like she was worth nothing. Five husbands, the one, the sixth man that she was with, was using her. And she was standing in front of another man, the seventh man, who was offering her living water, who wasn't going to abuse her, wasn't going to make her unhappy. He was going to give her everlasting joy. She had been trying to find the right man all her life. And here the right man, the seventh man, is standing right before her. And in verse 19 it says, Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim that it is here on Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? In other words, she's putting up more of a barrier between her and Jesus. You think you guys have the right worship, but look at our worship that we have here. We put up barriers when we talk about worship. We, we talked about it during Sabbath school today. 
Some people worship with their hands up, some down. I, I remember I'm a, I serve on the Andrews University Seminary Committee where we study, uh, we look at making sure our seminary stays very strong. And I remember a few months ago as I was there for the meetings, we had a um, Andrews University Seminary went over to, I'm thinking it was Rwanda. And they were putting on a seminar for a week to strengthen the work that was going on in Rwanda. And as they were there, they showed clips of the first night. Everybody was sitting there quiet. The music was playing, and everybody was singing very stoically. And I'm watching, I'm going, see, I, I was raised on African music as a teenager. I loved it. I, I've loved British music. I, um, going back to my punk rock days, I love ska, punk rock. But I liked listening to different music as I was one of a teenager. And one of the things I used to listen to was a group called uh, Jaluka uh, or Savuka. It uh, was a group that used to play with Johnny Clegg. And I used to love that music. And so I love African music. My favorite choir comes from um, Africa. And I'm trying to think of Ambassadors for Christ. Anybody know of that? Ambassadors for Christ? They're beautiful music. I love music that's sung with passion and with soul. I just love it. And so as I was watching the seminary put on their, their, their thing and they're singing away, I'm not seeing the African music that I'm used to seeing. And they said, do you notice that people are very non-reactive in the singing? We said, yeah, that it just doesn't seem like what I'm used to. And they said, they thought we were from the higher organization and they were trying to be very well behaved. But when they found out we were from Andrews University and not from the higher organizations, they said, here's the second night. And in the second night, people were singing with joy, just with passion, singing, singing the music, the, the, the beautiful songs that we sing all the way around the world. And it was so neat. But sometimes we come at people and saying, no, your worship is not right. My style of worship is the right way. My culture has the right way to do it. And Jesus was going to put that all upside down. And that's what the Samaritan woman was saying. You Jews do it this way. We do it that way. Jesus had an answer for her. Even if sometimes we get hung up on the things, the little things that separate us. You see, some of us won't go unless our heads are covered. Some of us won't do something unless we're doing it in a certain manner. You know, when our young people watch that, they go, I, I, I don't understand that. And instead of staying and, and, and growing and all that, they go, I'm going to leave. In other words, we practice religiosity, but maybe not spirituality. There's an addiction to rules and regulations. You know, it looks pretty, it smells like nice, but no matter what, when we get down to the deeper levels, it's still trash. Reverence with depression. Our music also defends, uh, defines that, and I really appreciate the music that we had today. I, I love banjos. I wish I could play a banjo, but I can't get my fingers to move fast enough for that. Religiosity, it said religiosity is for people who are going to hell, and spirituality is for those who have already been there. Sometimes people, we can look right, we can wear the proper thing to church, we can be as, as, as combed, as, as edged as we can. But what's going on in the heart? How is my heart reflecting what Jesus is doing? And Jesus is trying to get to this woman's heart saying, it doesn't matter about your place of worship or this worship. And Jesus is going to cut away. In verse 21, Jesus said, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or Jerusalem. So in other words, Jesus went up to the table and wiped it clean. Said it doesn't matter if you're worshiping here in Samaria or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. So Jesus was saying, he said, you're a little bit off there. He says, but the time is coming, indeed is here now. Doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or, or a Gentile or a Samaritan or whatever. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, 
So those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And Jen, Jesus lays it down incredibly clear. I am the Messiah. She was looking for the Messiah. She was talking to the Messiah. And Jesus lays it out. I am the Messiah. Those words that were said before Moses when he was encountering the burning bush, who should I say send me? He said, I am sent you. And here Jesus saying, I am. And he's saying it as a Messiah. Just then his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. See, the class order. Even the disciples followed after that. But none of them had the nerve to ask him, what do you want with her? Why are you talking with her? The woman left the water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone. The important thing is, people, she left her water jar at the well. And she went running back to tell everybody. She went running back with living water. She didn't need the water that she had gotten from Jacob's well anymore. She left it there and ran back. How many of us today need to leave our stale water, our old wine in old wineskins behind, and take the living water that will transform us, give us life, and when we speak it to other people, other people will say, I want that living water too. How do we know this will happen? Because it happened to her. And she went out and said, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. And Jesus said, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. They were going to know, just not then. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and the harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already, what? Ripe. People, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Jesus had already promised us that there's going to be a great harvest. And he says to the disciples, he says, look around, the fields are already ripe. But the problem is, we're stuck here in our churches, not going out to our communities where the ripe harvest is. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it is true. I sent you to harvest where you did not plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to, uh, gather the harvest. And it goes on to say in verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village, so he stayed for two days. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves, and now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. These people had exchanged the exchange gospel they gave up their death, their stale water, and accepted the living water and eternal life that Jesus was freely given. So I'm asking you today, people, what stale water have we been chasing after or carrying on our backs or saying, this is really important? And Jesus wants to wipe it away and says, the living water is important. The Messiah is important. Look to Jesus with all your heart, mind, and soul. Keep your eyes on Jesus. When you keep your eyes on Jesus, people, we will have that living water to share. When we take our eyes off Jesus and we go under those rabbit holes, the things that distract us, the things that separate us, the things that Jesus goes in the end, I don't really, it's, it's not really part of my gospel. Let's leave those things behind. Let's give, him, give the living water that Jesus wants to give freely. But before we give that living water, you and I have to drink that water ourselves. If we are not willing to drink the water, we have nothing to share with those outside our doors. 
So the next time you go to Tim Hortons and you get your nice mint tea or hot chocolate, go there with living water. Make it a habit of going to places where people are that are not from your church, that are not from your social group. Go to places and hang around with people where the people are running away from God. Get to know them. Jesus practiced a, a strange way of evangelism where he went, went to meet with people that were furthest away from the kingdom of God. Not to where the comfort zone, to where the Jews were, but to where other people were. And he socialized them, he met them, he talked to them, he got to know them, he shared with them, he ministered to their needs. And when they had become friends, he said to them, hey, listen, I want you to get to know my Father in heaven who loves me and he loves you with the same intensity. You see, people, we as Seventh-day Adventists have been given a clarion call of the three angels' message. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in things that just, you know, guys, in 20 years, in 20 years we're going to celebrate the 200th anniversary of what great day? The great disappointment. It will be 200 years since 1844. I'm bewildered why it has taken it so long. I'm dumbfounded why the Lord has waited for that time. But I really believe that the Lord is waiting for you and I to drink that living water. We might talk about the living water. We might point people to where we can get living water. But I'm not sure if you and I are drinking that living water. And I think today we need to come to that clear understanding. We need that living water before you and I can share it with other people. You see, the first angel's message says Jesus has already won the battle and the good news is ours. People, we have good news to share. Unfortunately, we have been using fear tactics to share that good news. When the good news is what it says, good news. The second angel says that there is one who has lost the battle, but yet so often we spend most of our time there instead of telling people about the good news. When people have heard the good news, they will understand that there is one that has lost the battle. And the third angel says, choose the one that has won the battle already. Let's keep our focus on Jesus. Let's tell the people of the living water. Let's point everything to Jesus. Jesus has taken our place, become our brothers and sisters. We are children of God Jesus says in the most incredible way, and I, and I love this, he says, you get to sit on my throne with me. I love the exchange gospel that was on. Jesus goes, I will take your death and your life and I'll give you everything that I have. And all he does is he lays it out to us. He gives us the glass of living water. He gives us the close relationship he wants to have with us. And people, it's all for free. You and I don't have to do anything to, to twist it, to, to manipulate it. We just need to give it to Jesus and share it with other people. If you're daring enough, look up Isaiah chapter 53. And if you look up Isaiah chapter 53... Insert your name in the words where it says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs. Instead of we, say, Paul, or your name, turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and Paul did not care. I'm putting my name in there. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But there was a, he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that Paul could be healed. All of us, every single one of us, are like sheep that have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. 
He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he was, died without descendants, and his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of you and I. He had done no wrong and had never deceived any, anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Today, people, Jesus has exchanged our death with his life. And everything that he had, he's given to us. And that is the living water. I want you to share that with somebody this week. And if you don't have anybody to share with, you're not daring enough to do that, just say, Lord, I don't know who to share this with. Bring somebody to me. Show me that road to Samaria that I need to be there. Maybe it's a homeless person downtown. Maybe it's a brother or sister that you work with or go to school with. Just ask the Lord to show you. At the right time, somebody will come along and say, hey, I noticed you're different. How come you, all these things are going on in the world and you're not concerned about that? And you can say, listen, I have peace that comes from heaven. I have a God that loves us dearly. And you will share some of that living water. And you know what's going to happen? People are going to want that same living water. And one day I pray that it's going to be so packed in here that people are going to try to get in through the windows and get in through the doors. And when they can't, guess what they're going to do? Drill holes in the roof to get where Jesus is. Start praying, people. I do believe that we have been given a short time left to share the everlasting gospel. If my people who are called by name would humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their evil ways. What are our evil ways? Doing it our way. And if we would let Jesus do his work, if we would just be praying, God will do amazing things. But when God's people are not praying, he has nowhere to work. People be a church that prays. We are going to see amazing things happen in the next few years while we still have freedom in this country. Be a church that prays for Newfoundland and Labrador, where some of the hardest work goes on. I think in Newfoundland we have um, the highest ratio between Seventh-day Adventists to the population. Uh, the lowest ratio, sorry. Well, yeah, I think we have one Seventh-day Adventist for every thousand non Share the everlasting gospel, people. Share it with a passion. Thank you, Pastor Paul, for the wonderful message. I think that uh, this was a perfect sermon. Let's use the Mind Fits Flyers. Let's invite our family and our friends. Let them come to listen to the Word of God because He is the only one who can give peace to us. Shall we all be upstanding as we sing our closing hymn? Hymn numbered 109, Marvelous Grace. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Father, your grace is incredible and it is so free. And Lord, the condition is you just want us to grab hold of your grace and to hold it for dear life. So Lord, let us go out of here be a people that are holding on to your grace, that is holding on to the living water, that is holding on to the good news of the gospel and let's share it to other people. And Lord, sometimes we don't have to use words. People will just see it in our lives. So today, Lord, let's grab hold of your grace. Let us grab hold of all the things that you offer to us free of charge. And Lord, your burden is so light. So today, Lord, let us be a people that actually live it and believe it and share it with other people. And Lord, I really know that there's a time coming that when we do share it, when we are praying, when we are putting our lives before you, Lord, and asking for a miracle, that we will see people left, right, and center come to know you. And the glory won't go to us, it will go to you and only you. Throughout of all of eternity, Lord, it will go to you. In your name I pray, amen. amen. Oh, this precious blood. 